Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will discuss the daily edition of the newspaper dated 20th February 2019. So let us start our discussion. This news article on page number 7 is related to the 5th meeting of Islands Development Agency. In this various projects have been started and a review of the holistic development of islands was taken. So this becomes important for us from preliminary examination point of view under the topic Indian geography because it mentions about various important islands in the Andaman and Lakshadweep which are being focused for the holistic development of islands. And also this holistic development of islands program by Niti Aayog is related to the sustainable development which is also a part of the preliminary examination. So in this article let us try to understand what were the key decisions taken at the meeting of Island Development Agency. Also what is the role and composition of the Islands Development Agency and a little bit about the holistic development of islands program by Niti Aayog. So the various decisions that have been taken at the Island Development Agency's meeting are listed in this infographic. For example, a decision has been made to operationalize sea planes from seven islands in Andaman and Nicobar and the Lakshadweep Islands. So the islands of Andaman include the Swaraj Dweep Island, the Shahid Dweep Island, the Hut Bay and the Long Island. And those from the Lakshadweep include Karawati, Agati and the Minikoy Islands. So names of these islands are important for us from preliminary examination point of view. And you can see the location of some of these islands in the map that is given here. Now here you should note that some of the islands of the Andaman were renamed recently. So here you should note that the Havelock Island was renamed as the Swaraj Dweep. And this island will be a part for the sea plane operations. The second island is the Shahid Dweep Island and it was previously known as the Neel Island. And the location of this Neel Island can be seen in the map here. Further there is a proposal for operationalization of airport in the Andaman for civilian aircrafts. And you can note that this will be started at Diglipur. And the location of Diglipur can be seen in the map here. Further ecotourism projects have been identified in Andaman where the private sector will start participating. And these ecotourism projects will start in Smith Island and the Long Island. And these can be seen in the map here that Smith Island is in the North Andaman and the Long Island is in the Middle Andaman. Further a tent city to promote the tourism will also be started at Aves Island. And you can see the location of Aves Island in the map here. And regarding Lakshadweep you should note that these are the three islands where the seaplane operations will start, which is the Karawati, Agati and the Minikoy Islands. And also tourism projects will start in Lakshadweep at the Kadmat, Minikoy and Suholi Cheriyakara in Lakshadweep. And here also private participation will be promoted. So in this particular news article, what is important for us from preliminary examination point of view is the location of all these islands that have been mentioned in this article. And you can see the location of majority of islands mentioned in this news article in this map given here. Now here you should note that the Niti Aayog is undertaking this holistic development of islands program. And this program will focus on the sustainable development of the identified islands. So it is under this program that all the decisions that we have discussed in this article have been taken. Now to review the holistic development of islands, an island development agency has been created. So from preliminary examination point of view, we will look at the mandate and the structure of this island development agency. So here you should note that the island development agency was created in June 2017 under the chairmanship of Home Minister of India. So this agency falls under the Home Ministry. So this is a key and important fact for us from preliminary examination point of view. And this idea focuses on the holistic development of island territories of India. And under this it undertakes reviews on the progress relating to the holistic development of islands as has been mandated in this program of Niti Aayog. And who are the other members of this island development agency? So these include cabinet secretary, home secretary, secretary for environment, forest and climate change, secretary for tourism and secretary for tribal welfare. And this agency has identified 10 islands under the holistic development of islands program. So the names of these islands are important for us from preliminary examination point of view. So this include the Smith Island, Ross, Aves, Long and Little Andaman in the Andaman and Nicobar group. And from Lakshadweep, Minikoy, Bangaram, Suheli, Chiriam and Tinakara have been identified for the holistic development in the first phase. So all these facts are important for us from preliminary examination point of view. And here you should note that a practice question on this article will be discussed at the end of this discussion. And with this, let us move on to the next article. Now, this data point on page number 9 is related to a relationship between the corruption and the democracy in a country. So, in this, it has been found that in nations which are relatively corrupt, democracy tends to be weaker. 
However, in India's case, it has been found to be very different because India has registered an above average score on the democracy score. However, it is below average on the corruption score. So this correlation that democracy tends to be weaker in those countries which have higher levels of corruption does not stand true for India. Now, what is important for us from preliminary examination point of view is the organization that calculates the democracy score. So here you should note that Freedom House, which is an international NGO, calculates this democracy score. And secondly, you should note that the Transparency International calculates the corruption score. So these are two important pieces of information for us from preliminary examination point of view. And this becomes important because, as you would know, in the year 2016, there was a question which reads, Doctors Without Borders, often in news, is a... So it was a non-governmental international organization. So it is in this context that these two NGOs become important for us from preliminary examination point of view. And at the end of today's discussion, a practice question will be provided on this topic. And with this, let us move on to the next article. This article on page number two talks about two schemes of government of India. And they have got approval from the cabinet. The first one is the rooftop solar program. And the second one is the Kusum scheme or the Kisan Urja Suraksha Evam Uthan Mahabhyan. Now, both these form an important part of the General Studies Paper 3 under the topic Energy. And you would note that previously in the mains examination in the General Studies Paper 3, various questions have been asked related to the energy sector. For example, this question was asked in the year 2015. This question again was asked in the year 2016. And this question was asked in the year 2013. And all these questions were related to the energy sector. And this question that was asked in the year 2016 was specifically related to the renewable energy sources in country. So in this article, we will try to understand the salient features and key aspects of these two schemes. So first, let us understand the Kusum scheme or the Kisan Urja Suraksha Evam Uthan Mahabhyan. So the basic objective of this scheme is providing financial and water related security to farmers. And it has mainly three components. So the first component includes 10,000 megawatt of decentralized ground mounted grid connected renewable power plants. So this component talks about decentralized grid connected renewable power plants, which can be set up by farmers, cooperatives, panchayats or farmer producer organizations on their barren or cultivable lands. The second component is related to the installation of 17.5 lakh standalone solar powered agricultural pumps. So in this case, the individual farmers will be supported to install standalone solar pumps. And these solar powered agricultural pumps will now replace the electricity driven pumps. And the third component includes solarization of 10 lakh grid connected solar powered agriculture pumps. And under this component, the farmers will be able to use the generated energy to meet their irrigation needs. And the excess energy that is available with the farmers will be sold to the discoms or the electricity distribution companies. And this component will provide extra income to the farmers. So the target of this scheme is to add a solar capacity of about 25,750 megawatts of electricity by 2022. So these are the key components of the Kusum scheme and these can be asked in your preliminary examination. Now after going through these key components, let us look at the benefits from this scheme that are likely to arise. So the important benefits from the Kusum scheme include the environmental benefits, economic benefits and the employment related benefits. And as we know that it includes the installation of solar pumps, that is why it will have substantial environmental impact in terms of saving of CO2 emissions. And this will result in saving of about 27 million tons of carbon dioxide emission per annum. So this will have a very good environmental impact. Now, secondly, as these standalone solar pumps will replace the diesel driven pumps, it will lead to a saving of around 1.2 billion liters of diesel per annum. And as we know that India is an oil importing economy and that is why it will lead to reduction in the import of crude oil. And as we know that majority of the foreign exchange of our country goes into the import of crude oil. That is why it will also help in savings of foreign exchange, which is important for our currency fluctuations. And it is likely to generate employment opportunity equivalent to around 6.31 lakh jobs per year. And this will include both the skilled and unskilled workers. And it also has the potential of providing the self-employment. So these are the key benefits that are likely to arise from the implementation of the Kusum scheme. Now the second scheme that has got the cabinet's approval is the grid connected rooftop solar program. 
and presently the phase 2 of this program is being implemented and has got an approval from the cabinet committee of economic affairs so the aim of this program is to achieve a cumulative capacity of 40000 megawatts from the rooftop solar projects by the year 2022 so this target is again important for us now regarding the rooftop solar plants you should note that these are those solar plants which are installed on the residential houses and in these cases if the residential house produces more electricity than what is required for its use it can be transferred to the electricity grid which is connected to the discoms and in case these solar plants fail to produce the requirement of energy for the house these grid connected solar plants will draw energy from the electricity grids of the discoms and a concept which is related to these grid connected rooftop solar programs is the concept of net metering and a question was asked in the preliminary examination of 2016 related to this concept of net metering so net metering is related to the billing system which is associated with the grid connected rooftop solar plants these houses can earn money from the grid connected rooftop solar plants so the question that was asked in 2016 read net metering is sometimes seen in the news in the context of promoting the so it was related to the production and use of solar energy by the households or the consumers and in this case the households or the consumers can produce more electricity and earn money by getting their solar rooftop power plants connected to the grid system now after this let us understand what are the incentives that have been provided in this program of government now under this scheme central financial assistance will be provided for setting up of rooftop solar plants by a residential sector group housing societies or resident welfare associations now here it is important to note that beneficiaries of such schemes are important for us from preliminary examination point of view so here you should also know that who are not the beneficiaries under this scheme so in this regard you should note that this central financial assistance will not be available for other categories which include institutional educational social governmental and commercial institutions so these are only available for residential sector or the group housing societies so regarding the implementation you should note that the electricity distribution companies will be the nodal points for the implementation of this grid connected rooftop solar program now in this program the discoms are required to incur additional expenditure for the implementation of scheme in terms of additional manpower creating infrastructure and capacity building awareness etc and due to this these discoms or electricity distribution companies will be compensated by providing performance linked incentives so the key points that should be noted in this program are that the expected cumulative capacity from this program is about 40000 megawatt by 2022 so this is the target under this scheme secondly it provides for incentives under the central financial assistance to only the residential sector group housing societies or residential welfare associations and this financial support is not available to other categories like education institutions etc and finally the implementation will be carried out by the state electricity distribution companies so after going through this discussion you should try and answer this question from your preliminary examination point of view the answer for this question will be displayed after 5 seconds so the first statement reads that the grid connected rooftop solar program targets a cumulative capacity of 4000 megawatt by 2022 which is an incorrect statement because it aims at a capacity of about 40000 megawatt by 2022 the second statement reads that the central financial assistance is available to residential sector or group housing societies only and this statement is correct as we have seen in the discussion so the correct answer is b that is two only and with this let us move on to the next article this article on page number 8 has been written in the context of recent visit of crown prince of saudi arabia mohammed bin salman to pakistan and india and in this the author has highlighted that saudi arabia has continued to maintain a political position which is tilted in favor of pakistan and it is unlikely that saudi arabia will be balancing its position with respect to india and pakistan so this will form a part of the general studies paper 2 under the topic international relations so in this author has highlighted certain examples of tilt of saudi arabia in favor of pakistan further he has highlighted the causes of tilt of saudi arabia in favor of pakistan and finally he has highlighted the implications of this tilt of saudi arabia towards pakistan and its repercussions for india and ultimately he has provided certain recommendations to strengthen india saudi arabia relations and balance its position towards india 
Now to show that the Saudi Arabia is tilting its policies towards Pakistan, the author has highlighted two important examples. The first is related to the Kashmir issue and the second is the support of Saudi Arabia towards the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or the Belt Road Initiative of China. Now regarding the Kashmir issue, during the recent visit of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia has stated that it is committed to de-escalating tensions between India and Pakistan over Kashmir. Now this statement of Saudi Arabia reflects its intention in getting involved in the Kashmir dispute. However, we all know that India has always maintained that Kashmir is a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan. And India does not want to involve any other third party intervention in the Kashmir dispute and wants to resolve it between India and Pakistan only. Now the second example which has been cited to show that Saudi Arabia is tilting towards Pakistan is the intention of Saudi Arabia to invest in the China-Pakistan economic corridor projects. And this intention of Saudi Arabia has been despite the India's objection towards this project. Further, this article highlights that why is Saudi Arabia tilting towards Pakistan? So in this case, it has highlighted various reasons for this tilt. Now the first reason for Saudi Arabia's tilt toward Pakistan is related to its internal security. And in the past, the Pakistani army has provided security to the Saudi Arabian rulers. And in the past, Saudi Arabia had supported Pakistan and provided assistance to those Afghans who were fighting against the erstwhile USSR. And after the fall of USSR, the Saudi Arabian army supported the Taliban government. Now as the United States of America is withdrawing from Afghanistan, the Saudi Arabia is coming closer to Pakistan and is supporting the presence of Taliban. And this policy of Saudi Arabia is mainly targeted towards Iran in order to isolate Iran from getting involved in the Afghanistan issue. And this policy has largely been for the containment of Iran. And we all know that the Saudi Arabia and the Iran's conflict has been based on religious ideology, wherein Saudi Arabia is a Sunni dominated country and Iran is a Shia dominated country. And both these countries have not been in support of each other and are involved in various other issues in the Middle East, for example, the Yemen conflict. So in the Yemen conflict, the Saudi is also trying to ensure that Pakistan becomes a member of the Saudi-led coalition against the Iran. And finally, various religious fundamentalist organizations in Pakistan are largely influenced by the ideology of Wahhabism in the Saudi Arabia. And the Saudi Arabia hopes that this ideology which is getting support in Pakistan can be utilized against the Shias of Iran. So all these reasons are causing Saudi Arabia's tilt towards Pakistan. Now let us understand what could be the possible impact of this tilt of Saudi Arabia towards Pakistan on India. Now in this context it has been highlighted that India and Pakistan both have been maintaining balance in their relationships with Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now we know that Iran and Saudi Arabia are involved in geopolitical conflicts in the Middle East. And the most prominent example of this conflict between the Iran and Saudi Arabia is visible in the Yemen conflict. So in this line, it has been highlighted that if Pakistan tilts towards Saudi Arabia against Iran, then it provides Saudi Arabia with greater strategic value as compared to India. So in the context of this conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, if Pakistan tilts towards Saudi Arabia, it will provide it an advantage against the Iran. And that is why Saudi Arabia is tilting its policies towards Pakistan. However, this will have an adverse impact on India's relationship with Saudi Arabia. Further, you should note that Pakistan is geopolitically very important for Saudi Arabia because it shares a border with Iran. And this will help Saudi Arabia in pressurizing Iran if Pakistan becomes an ally of Saudi Arabia. So now what should be the India's position in this context towards Saudi Arabia? So it has been highlighted that India should focus on strengthening economic relations with Saudi Arabia. And also India should not hope for Saudi Arabia's support for India against Pakistan because Pakistan has become important for Saudi Arabia because of the reasons which have been highlighted in the previous slide. So finally, the author has concluded that by focusing on geo-economic relations between India and Saudi Arabia, India can balance the geopolitical relations between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. So after going through this article, you should try and answer this question from your mains examination point of view. And with this, let us move on to the next article. This news article on page number one is related to another important cabinet decision which is related to the approval for new national electronics policy. And this has been approved in order to enable India to become a global hub for electronic system design and manufacturing. So this will form a part of the general studies paper three under the topic economic development. So in this article, let us try to understand the importance and challenges of electronics manufacturing in India. Secondly, we will analyze the need for such national policy on electronics. 
And finally, we will look at the salient features of the National Policy on Electronics 2019. Now, let us understand the importance and challenges of electronics manufacturing for India. Firstly, you should note that electronics manufacturing is the fastest growing industry in the world. And electronics are finding applications in almost all the sectors of economy. That is why it becomes important for India to become a manufacturing hub or the electronics manufacturing hub. Secondly, electronics manufacturing is an important pillar of the Make in India and the Digital India program. Now, despite being an important pillar of the Make in India and the Digital India program, electronic manufacturing faces multifaceted challenges in India. And there is also a lack of adequate ecosystem for electronics manufacturing. And some of the challenges that are faced include lack of adequate infrastructure, lack of supply chain and logistics, there is high cost of finance, there is inadequate availability of quality power for electronics manufacturing. Further, there is inadequate components manufacturing base. And this means that there is lack of manufacturing of integrated circuits, etc. Thirdly, there is limited focus on research and development by the industry regarding the electronics and manufacturing. And finally, India is facing high value of imports of electronics hardware. Now, let us understand why is there a need for national policy on electronics. Now, the electronic imports for India was about $53 billion in the year 2017 and 18. And it is expected to rise to about $400 billion by the year 2023 to 24. Now, this import of electronic leads to the outflow of foreign exchange. And in order to minimize the foreign exchange outflow, India needs a national policy on electronics so that these imports can be minimized. And we all know that the foreign exchange is important for India to arrest the currency fluctuations. Further, security concerns have been raised regarding the electronics which are manufactured in the China. And recently, the government has started a review of import of electronic products from China due to the concerns over security and data leakages. Further, you should note that the national policy on electronics 2012 was launched when electronics manufacturing was in nascent or initial stages. So this national policy on electronics that was launched in the year 2012 has now become obsolete. And that is why there is a need to revise the schemes and initiatives under this scheme to match the current ecosystem. And finally, the national policy is required to provide a suitable ecosystem for electronics manufacturing. So in this context, let us understand the salient features of the national policy on electronics 2019. Now the details of this new policy on electronics are yet to be released. However, the targets that have been outlined in the new policy include a turnover of $400 billion by 2025. And the basic aim of this policy is to promote domestic manufacturing and export in the entire value chain of the electronic manufacturing. Secondly, it has provided four schemes in the new policy. And these include the interest subvention scheme, credit guarantee fund scheme, electronic manufacturing clusters 2.0 and sovereign patent fund. So the first scheme is the new interest subvention scheme and in this interest subsidy of 4% will be provided on loans up to rupees 1000 crore on plant and machinery. However, if any company takes loan more than rupees 1000 crore, the interest subsidy will be provided only for the first 1000 crore rupees and beyond the rupees 1000 crore amount, no subsidy will be provided. For example, if a company takes a loan of about 3000 crore, the interest subsidy of 4% will be allowed only on rupees 1000 crores and for the remaining rupees 2000 crore there will be no interest subsidy secondly the credit guarantee fund scheme provides security against the defaults on loans for the banks so in this case a credit guarantee fund is being created so that if any company defaults the 75% of that amount will be paid by the credit guarantee fund to the banks and this credit guarantee fund scheme is available only for those plants which invest up to rupees 1000 crores. So this is an important step to promote the small or medium sector enterprises. Thirdly, electronics manufacturing clusters will be created and in these clusters, infrastructure support will be provided to group of industries which are part of the product supply chain. Now in the previous policy under the electronic manufacturing clusters, infrastructure support was provided only to individual industries. However, now these infrastructure facilities or support will be provided at the cluster level and it will include all the industries including different industries of the supply chain. And finally, we know that the small and medium enterprises find it really difficult to get the intellectual property rights. So to assist these MSMEs, a sovereign patent fund has been created. And through this, the small medium enterprises will be able to acquire intellectual property for their products. 
So these are few salient features of the national policy for electronics 2019. Now after going through this discussion, you should try and answer this question from your mains examination point of view. And with this, let us move on to the next article. This article on page number 13 is related to the new rules which have been notified by the center related to the angel tax. And these new rules are significant because of the recent controversy which was related to this new tax. So this will form a part of the general studies paper 3 of the mains examination under the topic economic development. Now you should note that the concept of angel tax has been explained in the DNS of 18th January 2019. And here you should note that the angel tax is applicable to the unlisted companies that have raised capital through the sales of share at a value above their fair market value. So here you should note that most of the startup companies are unlisted on the stock market. However, these startup companies have been raising capital through the sale of their shares at a value which is above their fair market value. Now, as many of these startups have not been listed on the stock market, it becomes difficult to find out the actual valuation of these startups. However, to access the capital from the market, these companies have been issuing shares. And generally, the value of these shares which are floated by the startup companies is above the fair market value of these companies. Now, for example, if the market value of the share is around rupees 100 and the company floats a share of rupees 120, the income tax authorities are considering this 20 rupees additional share price as an income. And this was to be taxed at 30% according to the previous rules. And this excess valuation was not considered as an investment by the tax authorities. Now, this assumes significance in the recent days as several startups and angel investors had raised concern over notices from the income tax authorities. And this has been supposed to be adversely affecting the startup ecosystem in India. So that is why the center has notified new rules in this context. So now let us look at these new rules which have been notified by the center regarding the angel tax. Now let us look at what changes have been made by the central government in its new notification related to the angel tax. So first change has been made related to the definition of a startup. So previously an entity was considered as a startup if it was registered before seven years. However, now this period has been extended and if any entity which has been registered before 10 years will now be considered as a startup for tax relief from the angel tax. Secondly, an entity will continue to be recognized as a startup if its turnover for any financial year since its incorporation and registration has not exceeded rupees 100 crore due according to the new rules. However, previously this limit was rupees 24 crore only. And previously, only those entities which had turnover below rupees 25 crores were considered as startups for exemption from the angel tax. So now this definition has been expanded to rupees 100 crore. So firstly, there has been a relaxation in the definition of a startup for tax relaxation from the angel tax. Secondly, the criteria for tax concession has also been relaxed both for the startups as well as the investors. Now previously the startups could avail tax exemption from the angel tax only if the investment did not exceed rupees 10 crores. However, now this limit has been increased to rupees 25 crore, which means that all those startups who have an investment lesser than rupees 25 crore can avail tax exemption from the angel tax. Similarly for investors, previously there was no exemption from the angel tax in the rules. However, the new rules state that Investment by listed companies with a net worth of around 100 crores or net sales of rupees 250 crores shall be exempt from income tax even if the investment is beyond rupees 25 crore limit. So these are the new rules which have been changed. And with this, let us move on to the next article. This editorial on page number 8 is related to the pollution which is caused by the coal-based power plants. So this will form a part of the preliminary examination as well as the mains examination under the topic general issues on environment. So let us try to understand the key aspects that have been highlighted by this editorial. Now if you go through the previous year questions you will find that in the year 2011 a direct question was asked related to the emissions from the coal combustion at the thermal power plants. Secondly in the year 2014 major pollutants which are released from the steel industry was also asked in preliminary examination. And also in the year 2015, there was a question related to the fly ash, which is produced by the power plants which use coal as a fuel. So that is why the pollutants from the coal-based power plants are important for us from preliminary examination point of view. So in this article, let us try to understand the key points which have been highlighted by the editorial. And our focus will be on the major pollutants from the coal-based power plants from our preliminary examination point of view. So this editorial basically highlights the pollution which is caused by the coal-based power plants. 
and as to what must be the role of government in reducing the pollution which is caused by these power plants. Now regarding the pollution caused by the coal based power plants you should note that these power plants are important source of regional air pollution which means that they pollute those areas where these power plants are located. Secondly they lead to ecosystem acidification and the main pollutants which are released from the coal based power plants are acidic because the nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides are known to be acidic pollutants. And we know that nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxides are important ingredients of the acid rains as well. Now these four pollutants which are released by the coal based power plants are important for us from preliminary examination point of views. So you should keep in mind that the major pollutants released by the coal based power plants are the nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, mercury and the usual carbon dioxide. And all of these are important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. Now further this editorial highlights that the emission norms for these major pollutants were notified by the government in the year 2015. However, these notified limits have not been followed by the power plants in India. And in these emission limits, the deadline to achieve the pollution target was the year 2017. However, now this target has been revised to the year 2022. And it is in this context of the failure of these power plants to achieve the emission levels. The editorial highlights that the government should follow viable financial plans. So let us look at some of the suggestions which have been provided by this editorial. Now our debate has always surrounded the coal based power plants and the pollution caused by it. So here it is important to note that India produces 54% of its energy requirements from the coal. However, these coal based power plants have a large share in the pollution which is related to the sulphur dioxide. India is dependent on coal based industries and it is a well known fact. And further the editorial predicts that coal will continue to retain a high share in the overall power generation. So now the challenge in front of the government is to identify right instruments to fund the exercise of controlling the pollution from these power plants. And finally the government must focus on sulphur removal from the atmosphere as it can yield commercially viable quantities of synthetic gypsum. Now if you go through the previous year questions you will find that the question that was asked in 2011 reads consider the following thing. Now if you go through the previous year questions the question asked in 2011 reads consider the following and it provides a list of three pollutants that is carbon dioxide, oxides of nitrogen and oxides of sulfur. The question further reads that which of the above is or are the emission or emissions from the coal combustion at the thermal power plants. The correct answer in this case was D that is all the three are pollutants from the coal based power plants. Further in the year 2014 the question read which of the following are some important pollutants released by the steel industry and it provides oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So all four are correct in this case. The 2015 question reads with reference to the fly ash produced by the power plants using coal as fuel which of the following statements is or are correct. The first statement reads fly ash can be used in production of bricks for building construction. This is a correct statement. Second statement reads fly ash can be used as a replacement for some of the Portland cement contents of the concrete. This statement is also correct. Third statement reads that the fly ash is made up of silicon dioxide and calcium oxide only and does not contain any toxic element. Now this statement is incorrect because it contains large number of highly toxic elements. So the correct answer is A that is 1 and 2 only. And with this let us move on to the next article. Now after going through today's discussion you should go through these practice questions and the answer for these questions will be displayed after 5 seconds. So the first question reads which of the following islands are not a part of the Lakshadweep island and the list of islands include Long Island, Karavati and the Aves island. Now as we have read in the article which was related to the island development agency the Long Island and the Aves island are part of the Andaman Nicobar islands and are not a part of the Lakshadweep islands. So in this case the correct answer is B that 1 and 3 are not part of the Lakshadweep islands. However, the Karavati is an island which is a part of Lakshadweep. The next question reads that democracy score for a nation is released by which of the following NGOs? And as we have read, it is released by the Freedom House. Now you should also try these two questions from your preliminary examination point of view. And the answer for these two questions will also be released after 5 seconds. So the first question reads which of the following pollutants are released from the coal based power plants. The list of pollutants include mercury, carbon soot and fly ash. 
Now the correct answer is D that is all of three are released from the coal based power plants. And this is the question which we have discussed during the article which was related to the grid connected rooftop solar program. And the correct answer in this case was B that is two only. With this we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now let us move on to the question for the day.